Sir. Sorry, Antonia. Yes. Uh, Jason cannot enter the lesson because he's having Wi Fi problems. He tried, but it's That's not a problem. Is he the person I spoke about yesterday? No, right? No, no. No, no, okay. So, no, not a problem. That's completely fine. Um, so, oxymercuration, demercuration, okay. This we spoke a little bit about last time, but I'm going to start from it as well, just to make sure that we would have covered our basics because this is something that is completely new. So here you are simply adding a hydroxyl group, okay? And this hydroxyl group is going to go to the Markovnikov's position, okay? Now we say it goes to the Markovnikov's position. This means it follows Markovnikov's rule, okay? It's important to try and note when we have something that follows Markovnikov's rule, because at the end of the day, that is literally, okay, what we're gonna be doing. Um, now, Markovnikov's rule is, of course, very important when it comes to, when it comes to these kind of structures, okay? So Markovnikov's rule, I would say it was important at a level, it's as important this year, okay? So just make sure that you are in a position where you know how to do it. And this was the mechanism where the mercury will interact with the carbonyl, okay? It will act as an electrophile. When you then cleave it, okay? When you then cleave the mercury bond with water, you will form the Markovnikov's product, and then you can reduce your compounds using an AVH4 to actually remove the mercuric salt. Now, remember, this reaction is only, we only consider it because at the end of the day, okay, at the end of the day, water does not really want to react. The delta G4 water is quite an, a little bit of an equilibrium. And therefore, because it is an equilibrium, what happens is, okay, what happens is that at the end of the day, in your position, you would end up having an inefficient reaction, okay? And you never want to have an inefficient reaction. Okay, now I'm saying this because these items, okay, these type items are normally subjects where you as students might actually have a little bit of problem with, okay? You as students might have a little bit of a problem with, okay? But the reactions you've done at a table doesn't mean they are wrong. And see, they are possibly correct. But the situation is that you need to be in a position to be aware that it wasn't the most efficient of reactions. Okay? It wasn't the most efficient of reactions. Okay? I'm saying that because it is very, very, very important. Okay? I am saying that because it is very, very, very important. And this is the product, okay? You have a much higher yield. We have a much higher yield when compared to the HUSO4 reaction. And in this reaction, okay, in this reaction, you will end up in a situation where, yes, you are going to be in a position where you will be able to get a better yield. Yield is everything. When it comes to chemistry, yield is everything, okay? I know that some students tell me, but why should I care about yields? Yields are literally, 
okay? Yields are literally the most important aspect, okay, of chemistry. Yields are literally the most important aspect of chemistry. So when it comes to yields, please do note that yields, you have to know them. You have to, when I say know them, not the number, no need to actually know the number and tell me, okay, this is going to be 95% yield, but the difference, okay? So that is something very important. Here we can see that for the hydration that we used to do before, there is a balancing between the two isomers. Okay, and you will get the non Markovnikov product as well. Okay, you will get the non Markovnikov product as well. So, that is something that is also quite important. So, that is also quite important. So, you would need to actually know how to do that. Okay. Now, hydroporation oxidation, this is going to be anti Markovnikov. Doesn't mean it's going to be truly anti Markovnikov. Okay. This is something that we call it anti Markovnikov simply because it looks like it's going to be the anti Markovnikov product, but this will be the Markovnikov product, but it's going to have something, it's going to have something a little bit different. Okay, this is going to have something a little bit different, and therefore we need to see what this is going to be. Now, have you done boron in inorganic yet? Not in detail, sir. Not in detail, but you've mentioned it, right? There you go. Okay, so in boron, you know that the boron is a little bit electron poor, it's electron deficient. Because it's electron deficient, it is a Lewis acid. And therefore, this can actually interact with alkenes. So there is a mechanism here. We're going to take a look at it. Okay. But this would result in allowing, this would result in allowing, okay, for anti Markovnikov hydration. Everything we're going to be doing will be following Markovnikov's rules everything, but it will also allow for, or at least the end product will be the anti Markovnikov rule. Okay, the end product will be the anti Markovnikov rule. Issa. Why is this important? Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, most of the reactions are going to be following Markovnikov's rule. And if they are going to be Markovnikov's rule, that means that's not what you really, really want. Okay? It won't be what you really, really want. Okay? So, the key is the treated zone that is Zaira. Okay? Always keep that, always keep something like that in mind. So, borane exists as a dimer to get the octet. So, borane on its own, it will dimerize. This is something like aluminium chloride. Aluminium chloride will also dimerize. Okay? Aluminium chloride will also dimerize. So, borane is something exactly like that. And it will dimerize because, it will dimerize because borane is electron deficient. And it can easily find a way how to get, easily find a way how to get the full octet. So it will want to have the full octet. Now, this full, this full octet will be achieved by something like this. Okay, so it will end up being an sp3 hybridized. Boron, would normally borons are sp2 hybridized because the last p orbital will not be will not be reacting. 
Ok. Um, once that happens, you will form a four-centered transition state. Now, I wouldn't worry too much if I worry about four-centered transition states and things like that. Okay, but I would be noting that you have an interaction. Okay, and the hydrogen would actually end up interacting. Okay, and And you will be able, you will be able to see what's happening. So the electrons from the carbon are going to be donated to the boron. Once the electrons are donated, then you have a transition state. And from here, you will end up with the possibility of a reaction. This can be done three times. So please know that this boron is now also that boron is now also going to be electron poor. Okay? That boron is now also going to be electron poor. Okay? So keep that in mind. And because it's going to be electron poor, then and only then it will happen three times. And if I were you, I would try and see why this is happening. Tipo, honestly, I think I think it's a very interesting. Okay, I think it's a very interesting aspect to try and see what is going to be happening okay so i would try and repeat it three times and see what this will result in again i would try it doesn't matter if you don't get it right nothing happens but if you can get it right then it's literally going to be okay it's going to be something very important for you So that's why I'm telling you, I would try it. Okay, then you can oxidize it with H2O2 and you will get your alcohol. Now, let's see if you have, if I have to look at it at the end. I was gonna say, let's see actually what happens. So wherever you add the boron, you will end up having the alcohol. And the, bo the boron follows Markovnikov's rule. Because the boron follows Markovnikov's rule, then when you change the boron into the alcohol, it will look as if it is going to be the anti Markovnikov's product. Okay? And here you can see the whole step. And here you can see the whole step. Now, once I, fill, once I fill explain the mechanism, I will tell you what's important here. Okay? So, boron is electron poor. Okay, so this is the mechanism. Boron is electron poor. So, even once it's reacted with, even once it's reacted, okay, um, in with the alkane, alkenes, now it's an alkane pretty much, it's still gonna be electron poor. Therefore, the hydroperoxide ion can give it an electron. And this will cleave the bond. It will cleave the bond by shifting electrons from the boron-carbon bond and preparing a boron-oxygen-carbon interaction. Okay, so the R and the carbon ends up migrating. Okay, the carbon ends up migrating. Now, this is something that I think would be relatively interesting. And not just relatively interesting, I think it's quite cool, quite nice. Okay. 
So I'd say that if I were you, I would try, I would try to try out to understand the mechanism, how it happens. Of course, once this first step happens, then you're gonna have a second peroxide reacting and the third peroxide reacting, okay? Then to hydrate them, add base. Then to fully produce the alcohols, add a base, okay? In my opinion, in my opinion, this is something that is relatively important, okay? This is something that I would try, at least I would try to be able to understand these mechanisms. Now, mechanisms are very important in organic chemistry. I'm pretty sure that you've understood that maybe last year. So personally, I would completely try and say, listen, it's important to be in a position where I can actually try and understand these mechanisms to the best of my ability. Doesn't mean that there will not be any mechanisms, okay, where you're gonna tell me, but this seems to be difficult, but let's try and study them. So what I would recommend in studying mechanisms is go home. Now we're all home because of the way the pictures are situated, but go home, spend 15 to 30 minutes copying the mechanism properly, okay? Copying the mechanism properly. Okay, I would say that that is very, very important. Okay, I am saying this because mechanisms are something that I would highly recommend that you would do and you would be able to get completely correct, okay? As far as I'm concerned, you should always be able to try and get the mechanisms spot on. Will you have mechanisms in your exam? Yes. Okay, yes, I will be asking for mechanisms in your exams. Okay, so the Kiyashi Haja, the LNMN, the IA Vera importanti. So you should, in theory, try to get the mechanisms always correct. Okay, so of course. If for some reason you don't get something, you don't understand something, that's fine. But always try, always try to get everything correct, okay? So that is something that I would always get you or try to get you to do properly. Mechanisms are something that it is up to you. You can go home and study. You can go home and read. Now, that is my opinion. So hopefully, hopefully you would be able to do that, to listen to me and do that properly. Okay, hopefully. So carbenes, carbenes are pretty much carbons, okay, with a, oh, CH2 with an open. It's this kind here, and it can be prepared by the, the deprotonation of a methyl cation. It is highly, highly reactive, okay? It is highly, highly reactive. And it's something that 
you should be able it's something that you should be able to do you should be able to understand and to try everything okay about this because here all you're doing is you are literally removing a proton so you might tell me but what does this mean by deprotonating you are putting two electrons from the carbon okay so in fact this would be in fact this would be completely stable okay this would be no charge it would be fine okay so carbenes are highly reactive and carbenes one of the ways how to make that is through bond cleaving of diazomethane okay so diazomethane is something that you might have not seen before so it is ch2 connected to the azo group okay and triple bond n plus and this can be easily broken and here you can see that you produce nitrogen and you produce methylene so this would be highly highly stable okay this would be highly highly stable so it's something that you might want to use then you can also make it using dichlorocarbene from chloroform now this would have different reactivities and different stabilities so you might need you might you would want to see why you're using it okay you would want to see here why you're using it and you can also have the simmons three agent which is an, an organometallic intermediate where you are breaking two carbon iodine bonds to prepare the carbene again these are all dependent on what you would need okay these are all dependent on what you would need okay yes can you please remind me what chapter this is on the book it's 12. thank you welcome So, carbene additions are stereospecific. Now, here you have to pay attention. Stereospecific doesn't mean they will also always have one, okay? Doesn't mean they will always have the same stereochemistry, but this means if you have one particular stereoisomer, then you can probably be able to push one over the other, okay? you can push one over the other. Um, and then you can have them always repeat a bit, repeat a bit, repeat a bit, repeat a bit. This will also end up adding a carbon to carbon bond, which is one of the few reactions where this is actually possible, okay? You haven't done this too many times. Okay, you haven't had this too many times. And you are also producing a, a cyclopropane. Now, cyclopropanes, they're not that stable. You can easily react them. But you are making a, cyclo a cyclopropane. Okay, so keep that in mind. And here you have two examples. You have cyclohexene reacting with carbene, and it's giving you by cycloheptane. Now, the naming of these compounds, you don't need to know, okay? And you have, I think that is hex3ene reacting with carbene as well. And this is giving you cis cyclopropane. And these are going to be both cis because the carbene will attack from the same side. The second one is a little bit more complex, as in you are using the second method, okay? So you are using the dichlorocarbene which you can then use for other reactions. 
And the cement, the cement the tree agent can also be used. And here you are using the zinc copper as a catalyst, okay? But for me personally, I would rather use the first method, okay? The azo, the diazo, diazomethane. That's what my opinion would be. Cyclopropanes are made by nature, okay? And therefore, there might be some drugs where you will want, okay, where you will want to actually um, where you will want to actually be in a position where you can actually say, okay, I want to do this. Okay, I know. I want to do this because nature is nature has done it itself. Okay, and you want to replicate it in some sort of medicine. But it would be something that you would need to know. Okay, you would need to know about it beforehand. Okay, but this is something where I would do it. Okay, if I were you, I would do it accordingly. So, it's not going to full card to call. Electrophilic oxidation, you can oxidize. You can oxidize carbenes, and when you oxidize carbenes, oh, not carbenes, you can oxidize ethylene. So, when you oxidize ethylene, you'll get either the cyclic ether, okay, and you will also get the carboxylic acid. Now, the carboxylic acid is not something that you would want. Carboxylic acids, there are so many easier ways how to get, but cyclic heaters are very useful. Okay, if anyone will be doing synthetic organic chemistry in third year, okay, um, this would be for chemistry with materials and chemistry alone, I think. This is something that is very, very, very important. Okay, cyclic heaters are super useful. They are very, very important. Okay. So that would be something that you would need to keep in mind. And the example here would be, by the way, this is a peroxy acid, okay? Peroxy carboxylic acid. It is a peroxide for a carboxylic acid, okay? So they are highly, highly reactive. They are highly, highly reactive, okay? So it's something that you would need to actually be very aware of, okay? But it's highly, highly reactive. So I'm repeating that because you would need to keep that in mind, okay? I'm repeating that because you would need to keep that in mind. So you are producing peroxy eaters. This is a thin addition. Now this is something that you would need to be comfortable with. For example, when I say thin addition, it's something that you should know, you should be comfortable with, okay? And in my opinion, it's something that you should be very, very, very familiar with. Okay, you should be very, very, very familiar with. So I'd say, please do try and do this properly. Okay, please do try and understand the sin and anti-addition because they are very, very, very important. Okay, they are very, very, very important. But in this case, aren't you adding just the cyclic oxygen? Yes, but if there is functionality, you're going to be pushing them down. So if you're adding from the opposite, oh, you, flew, you could be adding anti, right? So here, the oxygen is going to be adding from the same side. So everything else is pushed down. So let's see that this is planar. Okay, let's consider this to be planar, Gabriel. 
So adding the oxygen, everything is pushed down. So it's as if you have the oxygen there, one, two, and everything pushed down. And then we can get it from the top. Okay. And if it was empty, then it would be from the other side or? Sorry, I'm from tech. But then if it were anti, then how would it work? If it were anti for this one, of course, you can't really do it. Okay, because that means that one is going up and one is going down, which with one atom, it's not really that possible. But we, we have seen reactions where the addition would happen anti. So there would be a two-step reaction, two-step process. That's why I'm telling you, very important to consider the sin and the anti. Okay. Okay. Um, It's important at the end of the day, because once you're considering this, okay, um, how do I say this? You are in a position, Gabriel, that at the end of the day, these kind of, these kind of, how do I say this? I need a demia. These kind of questions, okay, sin and anti, it's not just for one reaction. Yes, here the oxygen cannot be anti. It's very difficult for the oxygen to be anti. But it's mostly not about the oxygen. It's mostly about the um it's mostly about the type of reaction, what would, where, did, where, where, would the react, where should the reaction attack from? What should be happening? Okay, that's what you need to keep in mind. The reaction here is gonna be from the top, from the top side only. Now, the fact that oxygen can only attack from the top side doesn't matter, it doesn't come into it. This reaction can only attack from the top side only, or bottom, doesn't matter, but from one side and that's it. And normally it means that it's gonna happen first from the top, then the second part from the bottom. Here, the oxygen is gonna attack the carbon from the same side, the two carbons from the same side, okay? Sin means you are attacking the two carbons, okay, from the same side. All right. Okay. So for these reactions, they have to be sin, but if there was another step where it was added, where another chemical was added in the opposite direction, then it would be anti. Yes. Okay. Now the mechanism is a concerted mechanism. So mechanisms, this is you can you can, you might think that you have a lot of arrows here. Okay, so let's start and go through them properly. This is one, two, three, four. So the mechanism is always a flow of electrons. And today we'll do this. We'll finish this. Let's see. Yes, and stop here. Okay, and next week we'll actually finish alkenes we're very good on time so let's do this and stop here so even you can go home and i would highly recommend open volhart okay whatever means you've got for volhart okay open volhart and try to figure out what's happening okay and try to see what you can do. I think that is very, very useful. I think that's something that if I were in your position, I would be doing it, okay? So now, so the double bond detects the oxygen. The oxygen then donates the electrons to the carbon-oxygen bond, but the carbon would end up having five electrons. So the carbonyl bond would then extract a proton from the peroxide. But this proton had a bond with the oxygen-hydrogen. So that ends up going back to the oxygen. So we're saying attacking, let's try and change the color here. Attacking the oxygen, cleaving the peroxide bond, creating a double bond 
with the carbon. That cannot happen because the carbon has five bonds. Therefore, the oxygen will extract a proton. Now we have an oxygen hydrogen bond, but there was already an oxygen hydrogen bond prior to that. So that will then attack the electrophilic carbon. Okay? And you will get the structure there. Now, it's only one step. Okay, it's only one step. I am saying this, it's only one step because this is very, very important. Okay, this is very, very important because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's only one step, which means, okay, please learn it. Okay, please learn it. It doesn't take much. Okay, it doesn't take much. So please learn it. Okay, I'm saying it because for your case, students, sometimes you do not realize, okay, sometimes you do not realize that these kind of questions, these kind of questions are actually very, very important, okay? These kind of questions you need to know very, very well. Okay, and if you don't know them, then good luck to you. Then you will start to struggle a little bit. Okay, but please practice these mechanisms. And this is, you have an application here. Okay, and you can see that because this is trans, then you're going to have one coming out, one going in. That's why you would need to know that it's in, because it would end up being in opposite directions. Okay, and see what happens and see what you can do. And I would actually recommend that you try these reactions. Okay, I would highly recommend that you try these reactions. I do think that at the end of the day, these are actually very interesting, very important, and I would highly recommend that you can try them out. And Yes, then here they continue to react with a nucleophile. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but the reality is that at the end of the day, you would need to know how to continue those. Okay, for now it doesn't matter. For now, focus on that mechanism over there. And here I have a couple of reactions. Again, I highly recommend that you start that you try to use Volhard. Full heart when it comes to these items, it is amazing. Okay, well, when you try to use these items, it is amazing. So please, okay, please try them. Please try them. Okay, I am telling you because these become super important and. On Volhart, at the end of the chapter, you will always have, always, always have um, um, Shismo, you will always have questions, okay? Now, those questions you might need. So normally what I would recommend is that you work in a group, okay? I would normally, normally tell you, listen, work in a group, try and see them out, try and work them out. If you don't have, if you don't manage, then it's fine. You can ask me and I will help you. But you try to work them out. You try to see what, what you can do. Normally you'll get somewhere. If you can't, just message me and I'll help you. I will, I, I, I've always told you I'm available, okay? But 
the reality is that you would need to be able to try to use them and to work them um, as much as much as possible. So what you work on, what you do, would be completely up to you. Um, but I would leave that something for you. Now, I am telling you this because some students asked me for advice on how to improve in the questions. Okay, so 